All right, guys, so we are talking, this is gonna be a pretty quick, this is a pretty quick section, so I'm, I'm just gonna do two quick examples for you. Um, it's really just an overview introducing you to what sequences and series are. So realize that sequences is just a list of things, right? In our case, it'll be mainly numbers. They don't technically even have to have any pattern to them, but the ones that we are gonna look at will have patterns because they're just more interesting. But you know, I can make a sequence of, um, you know, the ages of people and, um, a class that I teach or something that would it's just a list of things right that could be a sequence so um a series on the other hand is taking every number in a sequence and adding them together so that's where it can get kind of confusing especially as we go through the next few sections and we talk about whether a sequence or a series converges you really have to understand that a series is adding up all of those um terms together, okay? Whereas a sequence, we're just looking at, you know, what is happening to each term specifically. We're not talking about adding it up. So let's look at this first example. So we have this sequence, one, negative one third, one ninth, negative one twenty seventh, dot, dot, dot. So we want to find the next two terms of the sequence, and then we want to find a recurrence relation that generates the sequence. So look at the different notations in this section. Um, you know, we use different notations for this. A recurrence relation, right, is just something that um, helps us find the next term based on the term before it okay so let's just kind of write down what we know so you know we i'm going to call that first term a sub zero that's going to be one we know a sub one is a negative one third we know a sub two right is one ninth i could have also i could have said one is a sub one um, the reason I'm doing a sub zero is because I can see a pattern, right? So I notice that. How do I get to the next term? I'm multiplying it by one third, and then I have like a negative involved too, right? So I could even say if I wanted to say find a sub four, so I want to find the next two terms in this series. So notice to get from one to one third, I multiplied by a negative one third, right? To get from a negative one third to a positive one ninth, I multiply by a negative one third again. To get to one negative one twenty seventh, I multiply by a negative one third, right? And then obviously then to get to a sub four, right? I would multiply again by a negative one third. So this would become a positive one over 81, and then to get the next term, which asks for the next two terms, again, I multiply by negative one third, I get a negative one, 243rd. <laughs> okay, so those were my next two terms. These should be pretty simple, not too bad, right? Those were my next two terms. Now, the next question that asks us to find is a recurrence relation. So, you know, I think our recurrence relation is going to be pretty simple. So if I wanted to know the next term in this sequence, let's say a sub n plus one, and there are a couple ways you could write this, but if I wanted to know a sub n plus one, I am just gonna take a negative one third and I'm gonna multiply it by the term in the sequence before it. That's one way to write this, right? So for example, does this work? Let's check. So if I were to check this, let's say I wanted to find a sub one. If I wanted a sub one, then in that case, n would be zero, right? So then I would have a sub one equals a negative one third times a sub zero. Yeah, well, what is a sub zero? a sub zero, right? I need that initial value is one. So it looks like, oh, Sarah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. oh no, we're good. Um, <laughs> looks like, sure enough, we get that one third. How about the next one? What if n equals one? then I would have a sub two, right? If I plugged in that one in for the n right there, equals a negative one third, and this n is one less than this n plus one, so one less than two is one. So if I took a negative one third times a, times a sub one, well, I found out what a sub one was, it was a negative one third, and sure enough, I get a positive one ninth. So it looks like my recurrence relation is going to work. Now, when I technically write out my recurrence relation, not only should I write out the rule, so I'm just gonna rewrite this, a sub n plus one is going to be a negative one third times a sub n, but then I also need to state my initial condition, okay? So I need to state the initial value. I'm gonna say then that a sub zero right, is going to be one. I have to give you off a starting point, right? What if a sub zero was seven? Then I'd be multiplying every term by a negative one third. So I'd start with um, seven and then negative seven thirds. So it matters what that initial value is um, for the first term of the sequence. So this right here is my recurrence relation. And that's what it was asking me to find. 
All right, and then the last thing this says is also find an explicit formula for the nth term of the sequence. Okay, so I'm gonna write out the terms of this sequence again. So what do we mean by an explicit formula? Well, with a recurrence relation, right? If I wanted to find, you know, like the hundredth term of the sequence or a sub 100, let's say, because the hundredth term of the sequence would really be the 99, a sub, whatever, because <laughs> I'm starting at zero. If I wanted to find a sub 100, notice you guys what, whoa, I did not mean to do that to you. Notice everything just goes away. Um, notice I would have to have a sub 99, right? And then to get a sub 99, I'd have to have a sub 98. I don't wanna have to do all that. So that's what they mean by that explicit formula. If I asked you what is the hundredth, a sub 100, right? You should be able to, an explicit formula would able, you'd be able to find that. Can't always do that. You can't always find an explicit formula for a recurrence relation. Um, at least at this level, we won't always be able to. But let's see if we can find a pattern here. So when you look at something like this, what you want to start thinking about is not necessarily how could I get the next term of the sequence from the term before it, but is there anything that is um, common with these terms based on where they're at? So notice this is a sub 0. And what I mean by where they're at is I mean by their index, a sub 2 a sub 3, a sub 4, a sub 5. Well, well, look at here, you guys. There's something that's kind of cool that's happening here. Let me get kind of a different color. Whoops. Uh, let's do some purple. That sounds good. Um, if you notice, well, I'm not even going to do a sub 0 yet, but this one right here, that one, notice 3 to the first power is 3, right? And this 2 right here, 3 squared is that 9 in the denominator. That 3 right there, if I took 3 and I cubed it, that would give me that 27. So if you notice, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to relate some of these numbers. That 1 on top I can deal with, right? They all have a 1 on top, so I'm not too worried about that. Um, but I want to relate my index, which is that 4, to what number is changing here. And 3 to the 4th is 81, and 3 to the 5th is 243. Let's see if that's going to work for the zero. Is 3 to the zero 1? Yeah, it sure is, right? So here's my hypothesis then. <laughs> if I were to rewrite this, I could think of this as 1 over 3 to the zero. I'm going to take care of that negative here in a moment. 1 over 3 to the first, 1 over 3 squared, 1 over 3 cubed, right? 1 over 3 to the fourth, dot, 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 and then what would the nth term be? a sub n? It looks like to me it would be 1 over 3 to the n, right? So if I want a sub 100, okay, then I would just do 3 to the n, or if I want the kth term, right, then I would do a 3 to the k. Now you asked me, what about that negative, Sarah? Well, that actually is a pretty easy thing to bring in. So notice I have a negative. If I took negative one and I raised it to the zero power, I would get a positive one. If I took negative one and I raised it to the first power, I get that negative. If I took a negative one and I raised it to the second power, right, I would get that positive. What about negative one to the third power. Yep, I'm going to get that negative. So if you notice, I might, I'm not only taking 3 to the nth power, I'm also taking that negative 1 to the nth power as well. Does that make sense? If it's up an odd number, I'm going to get a negative, or an odd index, I'm going to get a negative. If it's an even index, I'm going to get a positive. So I an explicit formula for this sequence. There are a lot of ways we can write sequences. I could say a sub n equals a negative one third to the nth power. Sometimes you'll see it like this, a negative one to the n all over three to the n. Now, the thing about this though, is we haven't really told you what that first, that first one is gonna be. If we assume n is one, then actually we're gonna start off with, with that negative one third, right? So I wanna tell my reader for n equals zero, one, two, dot, 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 okay? Or you've seen the notation, I believe your book uses the notation with the, um, the squiggly lines. That's, uh, <laughs> that's the, the formal term for it, a squiggly line. So if I could do this over three to the n, okay? And then I could write where does n start? n starts at zero and it goes up to 100. So either one of these would be the explicit form 
for that sequence. Pretty cool, huh? Not too bad. All right, let's talk about a series then. I lied actually. Before we talk about that series, um, I know this wasn't part of the question, but could we make a conjecture um, about if this, does this series converge? Or not series, excuse me, oh my goodness. Does this sequence converge to a number, right? Well, so remember, if the sequence has a limit or if it converges, that's going to be the same thing. Then when I take the limit of the nth term as n goes to infinity, it should equal some number. And actually, if we look at this, we're going to talk about a lot of this later on. But if I took the limit of this guy as n approaches infinity, this is going to be a conjecture, right? So, well, what's happening to the top? as n goes to infinity. Well, this guy right here, as n goes to infinity, the top is just going to bounce from 1 to negative 1 to 1 to negative 1 to 1 to negative 1, right? But what's happening to 3 to the n as n goes to infinity? That is going to infinity. That's getting huge. So what I'm getting is I have relatively small numbers, right? Because those are staying between 1 and negative 1. And the bottom's going to infinity. So remember, small numbers over really, really big numbers are really, really small numbers. So my conjecture would be that this sequence does converge and that its limit is 0. That's what, that's what I would guess, and it will be. Um, even though one is negative, one is positive, I'm still getting really, really close to zero. Think if n is 100, right? Then I would have um, one over three to the 100th power. That's going to be a really, really small number, and it looks like it's going to zero. Okay, now I really promise I'm done. Let's talk about um, a series example. All right, let's look at this example of a series. So remember, a series is adding things up. So this notation right here, right, this is a capital sigma. If you think of sigma kind of as a Greek S, that's kind of what I think of it as. A sigma is like the sum of. Remember this notation, right? What does this notation mean? This notation means that I'm going to start where k equals 1. If k is 1, I get 1 over 2. And then I'm going to go to k equals 2, which is 1 over 2 squared k equals 3, 1 over 2 cubed. And in this case, this is an infinite series, right? Because this top number right here is going to tell me where my k ends. And in this case, my k doesn't end. k always is going to be um, a whole number, right? Or a natural number. Um, k could start at 0, so we could have whole numbers in there. But this is what my series is going to do. So remember what this s sub 1, s sub 2, s sub 3, and s sub 4. These are our partial sums. Right, and what this means, the s sub 1 means add up the first term of the sequence. s sub 2 add up the first two terms of the sequence, or series, oh my goodness, s sub 3 add up the first three terms of the series, and so on and so forth. So this part is going to be pretty easy. Now when we get to B, this could be a little tr more tricky, but let's just kind of see what we get um, for part A, all right? So part A, s1, that's easy. That's, one, that's the first term of the sequence. That's going to be 1 half. Let's look at s sub 2. So s sub 2 is going to be 1 half plus 1 over 2 squared, right? So 1 half plus 1 over 2 squared. Um, I, I don't know yet. I, I, I'm just going to find it, and then I'm going to see if I can find a pattern. So let's see. That's 1 fourth plus 1 half. I know that that is 3 fourths, right? Let's see what s sub 3 then is. That's 1 half plus one fourth, right? That would be two squared. And then um, two cubed is eight, so I'd have plus one eighth. And so let me move this over a little bit. So if I got a common denominator, I would multiply this by four and this by two, so I'd have four plus two, which is six, plus one, which is seven. So here I'm gonna get seven eighths. And then finally, s sub 4, right? What do we have here? Well, actually, to find s sub 4, if you think about this, this would be s sub 3 plus what when k is 4? 1 over 2 to the fourth, right? If you think about that. Because s sub 4 is just adding up the first four terms. This guy took care of the first three terms, right? We have that right there. And then I'm just going to add that one more. So I would have 7 eighths plus 1 what, sixteenths? Sixteenth? <laughs> um, seven times two is fourteen, plus one is fifteen sixteenths. So let's see if we can kind of, we, we need to find a pattern here, right? So if I kind of look at 
what's happening here. I want to find a formula then for S sub n. And the way I want to be able to do this is I want to use that index, right? I want to be able to use the fact that n is 7 to figure this out. So let's look at, we know S1 is 1 half. We know S sub 2 is um, 3 fourths. Okay, so I'm just kind of messing with this a little bit. I don't actually know what it's going to be. So I'm just trying to show you kind of how I would approach this. So what I know is I look at the denominators here. So I know the denominator, I go from 2, 4, 8, 16. This makes sense, right, based on um, what term we're at in the series. So I know that this right here is 1 over 2 to the first power. 3 fourths is going to be 3, which I'll deal with that 3 in a minute. So this is 2 to the first power. That's That 4 is 2 squared. That 8 right there is 2 cubed. Again, I'm trying to figure out how I could relate my index, right, to, to what is kind of happening with this pattern here. These can be tricky to find. Um, I know I've said this 117 times, but uh, it just, um, you got to practice these. I'm sorry. <laughs> 2 to the 4th. And then let's figure out if we can find a pattern with what's going on here. So this 1 right here, right, is one less than two. And look at this three. This three is one less than four. And this seven right here, this seven is one less than the eight. And this 15 right here, it looks like is one less than that 16. So if I could write that somehow, I could do, I could say this is two minus one. And that two squared, I could rewrite that as two squared minus one, right? That's what that three could be. And then that seven I could write, I know this is a silly way to write seven, but I could write that as two cubed minus one, yeah? And then here I could even write this as two to the fourth, which is that 16 minus one. So my conjecture then for the nth partial sum would be that this is basically two to the n minus one all over two to the n. Or another way, if I broke this up, which I can break this up because there's only one term in the denominator, I could take two to the n divided by two to the n, that's one. And then I could subtract one over two to the n. Would this formula work? Yeah, I, I think it would, and it actually does. I mean, if you look at what would s sub one be, I like this one better. So I would do, I have one minus one half. Yep, that's one half, right? What would s sub two be? Well, I would have one minus one fourth. What is that? Yeah, that's three fourths. You guys probably saw that before me, but s sub three then would be one minus one eighth. Yeah, that's seven eighths. I'm an eighth away from one. So there are different ways that you can look at this. I should have probably looked at it that way better. Um, but I think for my part B, um, my conjecture then is that this is my explicit formula for the nth partial sum. And again, what is the nth partial sum? It's the first n terms of the series added together. Okay, the first n term of the series added together. So it wanted me to find s sub 5. So s sub 5 is 1 minus 1 over 2 to the 5th. 2 to the 5th, I believe, is 1 32nd. So this would be 31 30 seconds. Okay, so there's my s sub 5. And then the next step, it asked me to find s sub 6, which that must be 1 over 2 to the 6. 2 to the 6, I guess, is 64, right? So if 2 to the 5th is 32, 2 to the 6th must be 64. I hope that's right. And so what do we get? 63, 64 there. Cool. I like it. That was pretty fun. Those can be not super easy to see. They're going to take some time. All right, let's see what else I asked us to do, and then we'll be done. Make a conjecture for the value of the series. Well, now I can absolutely make that conjecture. It's actually not even a conjecture anymore. Um, now that I have that nth partial sum, I haven't technically proven that that's the nth partial sum. That's what we're guessing it is. Remember that a series, um, the value of a series, if it exists, if it's not infinity, right, if that series converges, is just the limit as n approaches infinity. And we'll, you'll talk about this more when you get to 10.3. Um, it's just the limit of the nth partial sum, right? And it's really cool because what you can actually say then is you can say, now look what happens as n goes to infinity, this one doesn't care what's going on. What's happening to 1 over 2 to the n? 2 to the n is going to infinity. Mm. So 1 over infinity, that's not, it's an indeterminate form, but 1 over really, really big numbers are really, really, really small numbers. So it looks like my limit is 1. Okay, so that series 
we say that the value of that series is one. This is different than a sequence, right? We're saying that if you add up an infinite number of these guys, right, one over two to the K, if you add them all up, you will equal one. You will get something indistinguishable from one. That's what limits do for us. That's the power of limits. Whereas when I say if a se sequence converges, I'm not saying that the sequence is equal to one. I'm saying that those numbers are getting closer and closer to one. Or like up here when I said it was zero, I'm saying that the each term of the sequence is getting closer and closer and closer to zero that they converge to zero. Whereas with the partial sum or with the series, I'm saying that the actual sum, I would be able to say that this whole thing equals, wow, darn it, my dramatic moment was taken away by, I don't even know why I'm at that. There we go. Um, I would actually be able to say that this whole thing equals one right there. Oh, these are going to be so much fun, guys. We're going to have a great time. Let me know if you have any questions.